My name is Paul Lomax, and I work for Fisher Technology. Fisher is a global manufacturer of coating thickness, material testing, and material analysis instrumentation. And my talk this morning is going to be discussing common and complex uh, coating thickness measurement applications. Having said that, uh, there are several different test methods uh, that are available to measure coating thickness. And we're going to talk about those this morning. We're going to talk about some of the specific instruments that encompass those uh, measurement technologies, and also talk about some of the factors that influence uh, the results that we get. As we can see here, there's different measurement techniques that are available for coating thickness applications. The most common are X-ray fluorescence, beta backscatter, magnetic induction, uh, amplitude, eddy current, base sensitive, coulometric, Hall effect, uh, as well as measurement techniques for material testing and analysis as well. X-ray fluorescence is used for determining multi-layer plating thicknesses. It's also used as a screening process for high reliability electronic uh, components for ROHS uh, as well, counterfeit parts identification, and you can do solution analysis. For instance, I could put an unknown component in and determine what that component is from, of the alloy or the plating thickness. There's different types of, of instrumentation that's available on the market. This product is unique in that it encompasses multiple test methods all within the same platform. So if people's applications change, they could just get the specific test method associated with that application. An example would be this product could come with a magnetic induction and eddy current, but then if you would need, for instance, to measure um, using a beta backscatter method or measure using conductivity, you can get that test method incorporated in the same platform. One of the most common test methods uh, and platforms are handheld dry film thickness instruments. And again, these are used for determining paint or powder coating thickness, and they come in the form of integrated probe instruments or probes on the cable. They also are available in basic instruments or instruments that provide memory and documentation. Depending on the specific application would determine which instrument you would select. Now, there's multiple test methods that can achieve the same goal. An example would be, for instance, measuring zinc plating. You could, for instance, use magnetic induction to measure a zinc plated part, but it might not be ideal uh, because of the part geometry or size of the part. That's why, in this case, phase sensitive eddy current would be the method of choice. The phase sensitive method is ideally suited for measurements on very small components. It provides excellent repeatability. It's designed for measuring zinc plating on, let's say, fasteners, uh, nuts, bolts, things of that nature. Another example where um, the phase sensitive method would would be best suited would be a duplex coating in the automotive market. For instance, uh, measuring the galvanize that's applied first and then the paint on top of the galvanize and differentiating those layers would be necessary in determining each uh, part of your process. Phase sensitive method can do that in addition to measuring uh, in the same instrument a coating applied to aluminum. For instance, paint on aluminum paint on steel, or differentiating the multi-layers of paint and zinc simultaneously on one instrument. We always want to start our measurement procedure with the standards or calibration foils that we're using. We're, the instruments are only as good as those standards that we're using, and it's important that um, we select an instrument or use certified standards versus just mylar foils. One of the advancements that's been made is documenting that calibration process. So in this case, there's the ability at the beginning of each shift to get a record of, of the results of that calibration. And you can do that literally with the press of a button. And that way, if um, there's multiple instruments or multiple brands within the same facility, 
He can use this as a referee tool. For instance, uh, if you're measuring a primer, a thin primer coating, it would tell us that we used a foil, certified foil that was similar in measurement range to that primer coating, as opposed to a thicker base or clear coat. Again, this is an excellent and very quick uh, way to, to um, ensure that the instruments are, are calibrated properly, but also as a referee tool in case there's multiple instruments at the same place and they're not reading the same, the same readings. I, I read an article a while ago now, and uh, it was back in 1998, in fact, and the light bulb really went off for me as far as why monitoring film thickness or plating thickness is important. And, and this really summarizes it. Summarizes it. it. It shows us here that, for instance, if we were to control our process by as, as little as one-tenth of a mil, a $500 investment in one of these instruments could save us $25,000 in a year, just with one-tenth of a mil control in our process. And that really hit home for me, especially uh, in these economic times where we're controlling our process, controlling our material costs, and reducing those material costs uh, it could be the difference on whether uh, our companies are surviving or not. And I've seen in the last two years a real strong focus uh, on companies on, their, on controlling their tolerances, their process control. Uh, again, I think that this is a real good example of what, what you can achieve uh, even with a relatively inexpensive investment in, in instrumentation. As mentioned, there's things that influence film thickness measurement. And this is an example that ASTM uses of those factors. So curvature, or how close you're measuring to an edge, or the, the substrate thickness, or in particular conductivity, could in fact influence the readings that we're getting if we don't have an instrument that compensates for that, or if the probe we're using isn't optimized for those specific part geometries. What I mean by that is a lot of times uh, uh, people will have an instrument or a probe that is capable of measuring on a curved surface. But it might not be the most ideal probe for that curvature, that diameter. So digging a little bit deeper and looking at the specifications of each probe and what's available in the marketplace can help us achieve that goal of reducing our material costs. Conductivity is another uh, major uh, factor. Uh, if, for instance, we're normalizing and adjusting our instrument on a certain grade aluminum, and then we're measuring on another grade aluminum, we could get an erroneous reading if the instruments aren't conductivity compensated. Fortunately, uh, Fisher's instruments are conductivity compensated, and we can go ahead and take uh, readings on different grades of aluminum, different percent ICS, and uh, be ensured that we're getting a proper reading. It's just a practical aspect uh, in a variety of markets, including automotive. As mentioned, there's different probes for different applications. This slide just shows what those probes look like. We have um, probes that are ideally suited for rough surfaces, for, let's see, this one is designed for very soft coating, so I don't indent the probe into the surface. This one's designed for measuring on rough surfaces, it's a double prong probe, and then of course different geometries depending on where I'm trying to actually take the measurement. Probe performance again includes the capability of the probe, the trueness and repeatability, and the ability to measure on those different uh, geometrical surfaces. One of the major technological advancements over the last several years has been the data communication of our handheld instruments. And, 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 and uh, not coincidentally, the price of and capabilities of these handheld instruments with data output has, has drastically been reduced. So we're getting more uh, for less, and I would encourage people to take advantage of that data output to help us control our process. The typical data communication methods we're all familiar with, Bluetooth, USB, or RS-232. But what's different now is previously, every company usually had a different inspection form. 
But the tools outputted, for instance, in Excel or you know, a certain method like ASCII, and then it was always a complicated copy and paste function to get that data into the reports that either we require in our quality program or our customers require. The advancement now is that the data can go into whatever inspection form or report template that we create. And we could have multiple templates dedicated to the same instrument. And with the press of a button, those measurements will go right into that specific report. And again, the reports can be created uh, to include as much information as we want or as little as information as we want. We could have just the mean go to the report. Or we could have a list of all the readings. Could include the standard deviation or, or not, or a histogram or, or control charts, pictures, things like that. Uh, the message here is that really any, anything that you want from a report generation standpoint, we can create. And instead of all this previous copying and pasting, we can now, with the press of a button, put that data right into the, the specific report. It, it really uh, enhances the validity of the data. There's no um, uh, really a question about the integrity of the data because the data transfer process comes right from the unit right into the report template. Having said that, the, the, an example, um, a good example would be the automotive market. Let's say that we want to monitor film thickness on an automobile, which you know we all recognize. Uh, there's always there's always been a difficulty with making sure that we have the same number of readings on each part. Well, technology exists, for instance, with our FMP 100 instrument right now, where I could build a complete inspection plan. So if I want 10 readings on the left front quarter panel, and then I want 12 readings on the driver's door, and so on and so forth, I can build that in the in the instrument along with the picture, and then the person is taking the readings can go through his whole sequence and ensure, be prompted when to go to the next part. So now I, I, I don't have uh, 15 readings on the door when I should have had 12 and so on and so forth. And I know through a visual guidance exactly where I took those readings. So I can go back and do a, a selective analysis of each part or each area of the part to look at my spray pattern or my plating process or so on and so forth to evaluate the results. This is an example of what someone would see on the instrument itself. So instead of just, let's say, uh, uh, a certain film thickness measurement previously, now you could even build everything that was in your report template, uh, the, the operator's name, the type of uh, vehicle that's being used, the, the line, um, paint line, for instance, or plating line. And again, the visual prompts show us uh, in the reader where to take the, the readings. When the measurement is complete, it prompts the person uh, that it's been done. It tells them if it's been done uh, properly. And then you can download that data right into your inspection report. We've even done work now where we can upload this data directly to a web-based program. So if there's a, a, a quality manager located in one country and he wants to get the results of um, the, the paint line in another location, this data can go right from the instrument through the process and to a web-based software program and they can see the results of that. <clears throat> so I'd just like to conclude my presentation by, uh, by by reviewing the fact that there's different test methods for different applications. Just because one test method can achieve a certain goal doesn't mean it's the most ideal test method for that, for that application. The, the same can be said for uh, the probes. We need to look at the performance capabilities of each probe to determine if that's ideally suited for that application. And then I would just encourage people to take advantage of the software and hardware uh, advancements that have been developed to streamline the process, to reduce the likelihood of errors, uh, improve the integrity of the data, and get those reports done um, with the reduction of, of uh, administrative work. So with that, uh, if there's any questions, I'd be able to, I'd be happy to answer them.
Thank you.